Hello students, hopefully you watched the first video where I give a lecture about fungi. Now that you know a bit about fungi and their diverse strategies for life, we are going to conduct an experiment um, that, of course, you will design. So before we um, begin our discussion of fungi, Let's remind ourselves about how genotype gives rise to phenotype. Evolution is a look at how phenotypes have survived or not survived based on the environmental conditions in the geographic region in which the organisms live or have lived. So when we think about that, we are going to create a habitat and look at different parameters for life. So the materials you'll need for this lab are your graduated cylinder, the active dry yeast packets, which are just like baking yeast, water, camera, and a thermometer. You might want to run an experiment um, using one of these chemicals, salt, detergent, meat tenderizer, alcohol, sugar, that we've already used in other experiments because We've already pondered how those particular substances affect um, cellular composition. So I'm making this video looking at the Word document because I really want to emphasize procedures. So this should be real familiar. These are the exact same procedures we had for bacteria and actually the same procedures we had for plants as well. So the point of the online lab, the big picture is to understand experimental design. And so we are going to design experiments using different kinds of organisms. And the thing that will connect it all together is the principles of the scientific process, the principles of experimental design, data analysis, and communication. So <clears throat> when you design an experiment, typically um, you're looking at something that's happening naturally, like in an observational study, or you're creating an experiment. And in this situation, we're not observing yeast in their natural habitat, we're creating an experiment. And inside of our um, graduated cylinder is our artificial habitat. Um, so we want to think about what we already know about yeast and its use in our own kitchens. So take a moment to appreciate what you already know. How do you bake bread? And, and can you describe the bread making process in a scientific context? So alternatively, maybe you want to talk about how you make beer. They both employ yeast, and so you could use either real world context to explain this science. So ask yourself, why do you put yeast in the bread recipe and what are the yeast doing in the recipe what do the yeast eat remember that they are heterotrophs they are other feeders they are not producing their own food and what else do yeast need to survive so after you've warmed up your brain we are going to translate this life experience into a scientific process so you have one graduated, graduated cylinder. So you will have to do this experiment within each treatment occurring in sequence. I will discuss that in a second. Let's look at these directions first. So everyone is going to use this basic framework for the experimental design. You have a graduated cylinder and it's your habitat. It contains water, the same amount of water per cylinder. The cylinder should be no more than one quarter full at start. You will watch the yeast grow up the cylinder and record its terminal height. The graduated cylinder also contains yeast from the packet in your kit. Remember to divide up the yeast into equal quantities before you get going so you don't run out. You want the same amount of yeast, the biological organism, in each treatment of the experiment. The rest is up to you. You can vary the following parameters as described in the lab, or you can think of your own. You will need to provide rationale for why you chose these experimental conditions. In other words, 
What about temperature? What about light? What about salt, detergent, etc. is interesting to you as an experimental condition? The basic premise is that you're choosing the levels of your treatment that are in some way comparative. Okay, now I made this little tool, so let's look at that. All right, so rather than demonstrate the actual procedures, I'm going to use a diagram here, my picture, just because I think that it's going to help to show you the graphing potential, okay? So based on what we already read, get the right color in here, right? You're going to start in a cylinder. You only have one cylinder, so you're going to have to do these in sequence. Clean it, do it again. Clean it, do it again. Clean it, do it again. Okay, you don't have to clean it thoroughly, you can just rinse it out because you're just putting yeast and water in there. And if you do the control first, there won't be any other substances in there to affect the cleanliness of the vessel, i.e. the habitat. So everyone is going to make the same control and it is going to have about one quarter full of water. So let's just draw that line on everyone right now, okay? You're gonna fill the water to this roughly this height in the cylinder every single time, okay? In the control, you're just gonna put water in there that could just be tap water at a neutral, like a warm temperature. Um, and if temperature is not your variable of choice, you're going to use that same temperature of water in every single one. So what could you do to stabilize this? How about you put water in a mason jar and you just leave it out on the counter and then you have room temperature water and you can measure it every single time. You want to keep measuring it just to make sure that that parameter hasn't changed because you want to reduce the noise in your experiment, the error associated with things that you can't explain. So no matter what your parameter is, you have this starting level of water. Water is part of the habitat in which the yeast grow. Okay? Then you're going to have equal quantities of yeast in every single cylinder. There is nothing to vary here, okay? Those are the static parameters. Now, in the levels of your treatment, one, two, and three, okay, these need to reflect one variable, okay? So that might be temperature. That might be food source, which would be some kind of sugar or flour. That might be some inhibition like salt or detergent or alcohol, which we all know have some um, process to kind of break down cellular components. You might be interested in light. You might be interested in, I don't know, just about anything. The most important thing to keep in mind is that you want to be interested in just one thing. If you feel compelled to cross your variables, you're going to have to repeat these sequences with your single cylinder many times. So looking back at our document here, for example, if you have yeast at tap temperature, yeast at hot temperature, and yeast at cold temperature, okay? and then you also want to look at salt, then you have to cross the three temperatures with salt and without salt, in addition to having a control. So if you want to look at salt and you want to look at temperature and you have a control, you're going to need to run the experiment in sequence no less than seven times. Some students in the plant lab, for example, had a condition where there was no carbon dioxide, but that kind of defeats the primary biological process that we were trying to observe. So here, if you don't have water and you don't have yeast, you will be defeating the primary biological process that we are hoping to observe, which is the growth of yeast, okay? 
Now I want to look at one other thing that I saw students do, okay? It's fine to look at two variables, but they have to talk to each other. If they don't talk to each other, then you have two separate experiments. So maybe you want to know tap hot and cold temps and their effect on yeast growth. And maybe you're also interested in the salt question. And so you just throw in two more sequences where you look at salt and no salt. Now, that's fine. You could um, make it through that, but essentially you're doing two experiments. You'll need a graph that talks about salt, and you'll need a graph that talks about temperature, and the never, never the two shall meet. You could never draw a conclusion that talks about heat and temperature at the same time. Okay, so back to my fun drawing here. The reason why I wanted to make this little diagram was to show you how what we're looking at, these cylinders, is essentially the graphical representation, okay? You're going to make a bar graph because every uh, level of your treatment is a category, okay? The time here is a fixed element. You're not going to want to run your experiment for an unlimited amount of time. You're going to limit the amount of time. You're going to run your experiment for 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever seems appropriate based on what you find when you first get going with the control. If the control bubbles out of the cylinder in, you know, five minutes, then you probably want to use less yeast um, and reduce the time. If in 10 minutes the control has shown absolutely no yeast growth whatsoever, then you're going to want to go back to the drawing board and think about that in a little more depth. So now here we have this graphical representation of our cylinders. So on our graph, let's first draw in our axes. So we have the x-axis which usually depicts the biological response, and we have the y-axis, which typically depicts um, the independent variables, um, the treatments of your experimental conditions. It can also depict time, for example. So you'll want to have um, a label for the y-axis that says something more than y, and then there should be labels here that describe what these are, okay? I've written in the words control, treatment, level one, two, and three, but that's not enough detail. Okay, now we had a little red line here that was just showing us where the water was. Um, and so I'm gonna draw that in here. Oops, keep it red. And then we're gonna um, just model what you should expect to see. Okay, so whatever this volume is at this red line, say right here, it's 10 milliliters, okay? That is going to be your initial volume, okay? Then you're going to um, and watch the experiment unfold. So say in your control in 10 minutes, the yeast bubbled up to here, okay? That looks to me like it is about 50 mils total. Or, sorry, if that's 10, then it'd be 15, 20, 25. Okay? So 25 mils here. Okay? Now, if you want to know how much the yeast grew, it grew from 25 milliliters, which is the final height minus the initial height and then we get 15 milliliters okay so in the control conditions of say 10 minutes in room temperature water the yeast grew 10 or 15 milliliters then say in treatment level one um you know you give it some whiskey you just put one milliliter of whiskey in there with the with the yeast, okay? And 
and you watch the experiment unfold for 10 minutes and the yeast grows to here. Okay. And now maybe maybe your experimental question is about different kinds of sugar. Um, so now maybe you give one milliliter of orange juice to this yeast and it grows up to here. Okay. And then maybe over here you give it one milliliter of apple juice. Okay. So you've got this parameter sugary liquids. You've got three different sugary liquids. Okay, and the question is, which facilitates yeast growth more? Okay, so what I hope you're seeing me develop here is a bar graph, which is exactly what you will do when you transform your data. So here's the bar graph. The control grew this much, and the whiskey treatment grew this much, and the orange juice treatment grew this much, and the apple juice treatment grew this much. Voila! Now we have a bar graph. Obviously, your graph is not going to show the cylinder behind it. Obviously, your graph is not going to start at 10 milliliters. It's going to start at zero. That's why you have to do this math, okay? This is called final minus initial, okay? This gives you a total change measurement, and that is often depicted by a delta, okay? So that's your bar graph. That's your experiment. I hope I explained it in enough detail for you to have great success, and let me know if you have any questions.